Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Thank you for participating in this next installment of the Allegheny Conference Response and Recovery webinar series. My name is Kyle Chintalopoli, and I serve as the Vice President of Business and Economic Development on the team at the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance, an affiliate of the Allegheny Conference. During this crisis, the Allegheny Conference is focused on understanding the needs of our Pittsburgh region across a variety of constituencies and stakeholders and responding in real time with relevant, timely information. Since COVID-19 hit Southwestern Pennsylvania, we have held webinars with experts for deeper dives into the issues that are impacting our region. You can find all our webinars and related resources, such as the PowerPoints and FAQs, archived on the Allegheny Conference's Pittsburgh Region COVID-19 response site at alleghenyconference.org. Today's webinar is going to focus on early, and we do want to stress early as things are still very fluid, but the early considerations for reopening of businesses in our region. We have some excellent expert insights in store to get everyone thinking about what's ahead, but we don't have prescriptions for how this will happen. Before we get started, we do want to thank our sponsors, Peoples, Giant Eagle, Highmark, and UPMC Health Plan for their generous support which allows us to bring this webinar to you today, along with the more than 300 members of the Allegheny Conference's Regional Investors Council, whose support makes our work possible every day. As participants, we have muted your microphones to give our speakers the spotlight. However, please feel free to submit questions during their remarks using the Q&A feature that you'll find at the bottom of your webinar screen. We will address as many as our time allows today during the question and answer period that my colleague, Allison Treister, will moderate. Joining us now to discuss the public policy landscape around reopening and the implications for Southwestern Pennsylvania is the president of the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, Matt Smith. Thank you very much, Kyle. It's great to be with everyone and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share some of this information. As Kyle noted, it's still uh, very fluid, but but we're starting to get there with, with the real discussion around reopening the economy. I want to start out with a little bit of level setting. Um, those of us in Allegheny County, this is a really important point um, that often gets lost in the shuffle. Allegheny County um, has its own Department of Health, which is unique among uh, the 67 counties in Pennsylvania. And, and the County Health Department is led by Dr. Deborah Bogan. Um, and this confers a significant role over the public health issues and, and also the reopening issues uh, here in Allegheny County. So I just want to start with that level setting. Um, you know, we'll go to the next slide now, and <clears throat> many of you will, will probably have forgotten this, but way back on April 13th, Pennsylvania joined six fellow Northeastern states in a post-pandemic compact. And uh, so much stuff has happened. You can be forgiven if you've forgotten this. But uh, when this happened, we heard from a number of stakeholders who were very concerned that we would be locked in, particularly in Western Pennsylvania, <clears throat> to the same timeline that was being used by New York, Massachusetts, other states within the compact. But um, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you that's not going to be the case. That's really going to be an informational sharing of uh, data and, and resources. Um, and that what Governor Wolf has proposed um, is going to be much different, and I'll get into that in a second, but, but I do want to provide a little bit of preliminary information about uh, the negative impact this is the, the pandemic has had on Pennsylvania's economy. Um, Pennsylvania's unemployment rates during the pandemic have been among the highest in the country, uh, approximately 22% of the February workforce has since filed for unemployment benefits in Pennsylvania. Um, this puts us right at the top of the list uh, with other states, including Michigan, Kentucky, and Nevada. Um, and th this is obviously a staggering number. Um, and it's driven by a number of factors, but uh, one is certainly the composition of our labor force. Um, and so while no one disputes that public health is and should be paramount, we do believe it is time to have the discussion around the path to reopen uh, here in Pennsylvania, um, in which because of that composition of the labor force uh, will look different in Pennsylvania. Uh, that path will look different in Pennsylvania as compared to other states. Um, so we think it's a really important discussion to have, and, and we've had 
uh, this discussion with the state over the last four to six weeks. So I'll move on to the next slide. Um, on April 22nd, um, Governor Wolf announced a process to reopen Pennsylvania. Um, and this was the governor's way of taking the conversation in a direction that uh, is no longer solely focused on the public health side of the pandemic, it, it, as important as that is, and that will always be paramount. Uh, but the governor um, is pivoting to ensure that we begin the discussion uh, on reopening Pennsylvania's economy. And as noted on your slide, uh, there are a few key highlights to um, the governor's approach. Uh, number one, it's going to be data-driven. Um, it's also going to be evidence-based. And importantly, and this goes to the earlier point about the Northeast Compact, the approach in Pennsylvania will be county-focused. And so just as uh, the governor looked at it uh, in, in uh, shutting down the economy and in issuing stay-at-home orders on a county-by-county -county basis, he's also going to look at this reopening process on a county basis. At the end of the day, I would expect, <clears throat> as a practical matter, that regions uh, are, are bulked together um, and so that multiple counties uh, will be uh, moved from one phase to the other um, simultaneously, but, but the county data is going to really drive um, the approach here. Importantly for those of us in the Pittsburgh region, uh, Carnegie Mellon University is really at the lead of providing a data dashboard that includes, among other things, demographic information, health criteria, population density, mobility, testing availability, healthcare resources. All of that information will be included uh, in a data set to inform policymakers in making the decision to pivot from one color coded phase uh, to the next. And, and I'll get into the color coded phases in a second. The one key data point that I do want to pull out that the governor has specifically flagged is a key metric is um, when counties are able on average for the past 14 days to have 50 or less, 50 or fewer new cases per 100,000 residents per day, that is going to be a key marker in moving from one phase to the next. Um, and so we wanted to call that out specifically. Um, there's also other things obviously included like uh, the ability of a county to do contact tracing, uh, robust case investigation, um, you know, all the, the, the key metrics that have been talked about quite a bit here. Um, the CMU data dashboard is also going to evaluate inherent risks in certain industries and businesses. Um, and that's going to be used to prioritize reopening where it has the potential to make the most positive impact on the economy for workers and businesses while also mitigating against the public health risk. Um, and so, for instance, um, industries that are, uh, can be categorized as low or moderate risk profiles, low worker density, um, outside work, those kinds of things, those will be um, opened faster uh, than other parts of the economy. Uh, we expect that there's going to be um, further guidance from the Commonwealth uh, for businesses and individuals to enable employers to use uh, their own expertise many times in operating safely. And so that's going to be a very important feature um, of the process. I want to briefly uh, touch on the red, yellow, and green phase, uh, because that's obviously how this is going to be rolled out. If we can move on to the next slide, thank you. Um, right now, as everyone knows, we are in the red phase. Every county in Pennsylvania, all 67 counties, is included in the red, red phase with only life-sustaining businesses currently in operation. And this is the stay-at-home order that eventually included all 67 counties that Governor Wolf issued. Um, the ability, um, as I said, to move from the red to yellow phase will be driven by, by the data and, and, and evidence that's presented. Once a, a county in a region is moved to the yellow phase, this basically means that restrictions on work, social interaction are eased um, to some extent, but schools, gyms, uh, indoor recreation centers, large gatherings are still going to be closed and, and prevented. Uh, and the purpose here is to power the economy back up, but do it in a step-by-step -step manner and with an eye towards the public health. This is also a phase where telework uh, will continue where it's feasible, uh, businesses with in-person operations, uh, must follow business and building safety orders, 
Importantly, this is a phase where childcare uh, will come back online. Childcare operations um, will open. And this is obviously a very important point um, and, and directly related uh, to the ability of employees to return to work, uh, particularly if they uh, need childcare um, uh, for, their, for their children. And so that's going to be a really important part of the yellow phase. Uh, it's also going to necessitate um, additional state guidance, uh, particularly from the Pennsylvania Department of Education and the Department of Health and Human Services. And I believe at the end of the day, it's also going to require um, some sort of federal support and intervention um, to provide support and resources uh, to the childcare operators to make sure uh, that they can operate um, and, and mitigate risk at the same time. So that's a really important point that I wanted to note about the, about the yellow phase. Um, in this phase also, the stay at home restrictions are lifted uh, and replaced by um, those aggressive mitigation efforts. There's going to be some level of in-person uh, retail operations uh, under the yellow phase. Um, and restaurants and bars will uh, remain limited to carry out and delivery only. Um, the green phase, just to touch on that quickly, uh, is where most restrictions are lifted. Um, this is what has often been referred to as the new normal. And we believe this will be, um, you know, th there will be a necessity for business and individuals in this phase to continue following with CDC guidance, uh, continue following with the Par Pennsylvania Department of Health guidance, and that would include um, things like wearing masks, uh, still performing social distancing, um, and those sorts of things. And so that's uh, what likely will, um, uh, what the green phase will likely entail. But again, uh, this is a very fluid situation as, as we're moving forward. I do want to note, um, you know, on the next slide, you'll see, again, the key um, areas that will be examined, um, you know, as we move from one phase to the next, the testing capacity, the contact tracing capacity. I do want to note one additional thing that's not on our slides, um, and that's uh, something that the governor uh, provided details on last night, which is the construction industry, specifically uh, as a sector reopening first. And the construction industry is going to reopen on May 1st. Um, and as I said, the Wolf administration uh, provided guidance last evening on this. Just want to highlight a few things there. Um, the construction workers will still have to wear masks. Uh, businesses, contractors will have to have protocols um, for action in place when a business has been exposed to a probable case of COVID or a confirmed case of COVID. Um, those businesses will still have to maintain social distancing. Uh, there will be restrictions on gatherings of 10 or more people. Um, and importantly, uh, contractors are going to have to identify a pandemic safety officer for each project or site or for large projects for each contractor. Um, and the role of this individual is going to be to convey, um, implement, and enforce social distancing and other requirements um, of the guidance for employees, uh, suppliers, and other personnel on site. And so that's going to be a really important feature uh, not only, I think, of the construction um, reopening, but uh, as additional sectors reopen and, and having that individual identified as a pandemic safety officer. Just a few additional quick notes on construction. Uh, for residential construction, the state guidance is that no more than four people uh, can be on the job at any time. Uh, that does not include delivery code inspectors or, inspectors or similar uh, individuals who require temporary access. For commercial construction, uh, not more than four uh, can, uh, individuals can be on a job site of 2,000 square feet or less. However, for each additional 500 square feet uh, of enclosed area, there are going to be allowable additions of one individual per 500, 500 square feet, excuse me. Um, and so the construction industry will come on uh, line first. And, and again, we think that's an important step uh, in the right direction, given uh, the low, low density uh, of those workers and the ability to work outside. I also want to just briefly note um, that there is federal guidance uh, on this. The White House issued a uh, report, uh, which is uh, entitled Opening Up America Again, which provides guidelines. That was issued on April 16th, and I'm sorry, this is on the next slide. Um, and very similar in some ways, uh, to Pennsylvania. It's a phased-in approach recommended by the White House and the administration 
Uh, number one, uh, phased in return to work. Uh, phase two, larger venues can open with social distancing restrictions. And then phase three would be the full return to work. But I do have to note um, that the White House has been uh, in this report and uh, recently very deferential uh, to state decisions. And so I think many, if not all of these decisions uh, are going to be made by governors and local elected officials. And I think that's a really important point. Um, the last thing I wanted to note, and, and this is somewhat related to the ability um, to reopen the economy, and this is on our last slide, is uh, last evening, uh, the US House of Representatives passed what has been known or what has been called phase 3.5 um, of the CARES Act. And, and this is the funding that is the replenishment uh, of the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, as well as the uh, EIDL program through the SBA, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. But importantly, this uh, piece of legislation also provided for $25 billion um, that will go out um, in some combination to the federal government and to the states um, for testing. Um, and it's also going to require the administration uh, to provide a testing plan, a national testing plan, and update that plan every 90 days and correspondingly require states uh, to submit uh, testing and contact tracing plans to the federal government. So uh, I wanted to make sure I noted um, that particular piece because as I said at the outset, uh, testing, the ability for counties to test uh, and also to do um, adequate contact tracing is going to be a very important feature of reopening the economy. Um, and so uh, I will uh, now turn it back uh, to Kyle um, for additional speakers. Thanks, Matt. Uh, before we move on to our next speaker, I mean, you sort of touched on, right, the import of testing. Obviously, the federal funding that the, the president, you know, signed earlier today and it just passed Congress yesterday. Um, can you speak some to, you know, the timing of when Secretary Levine and the governor, you know, believe that they'll have, you know, that testing plan in place as well as those resources behind just given how key it'll be to really balance that public health considerations with, you know, the ability to reopen the economy in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, there, I, I don't have a specific date, but there have been, um, you know, there's been a recognition that testing needs to be um, three, four times uh, more robust uh, than it is right now. And so I would expect um, with this additional investment, this additional funding and focus, frankly, from the federal government on providing support for retracing uh, supplies as well as swabs and the necessary uh, equipment that's necessary to do the testing. You know, I think there, there's going to be a significant ramp up in the ability to do it, but uh, you're exactly right. That is going to be a critical part, even for count, a part of the reopening here, because even for counties that meet the testing or meet the, the positive number that I identified earlier, um, you know, the, the testing needs to be ramped up in order to um, ensure that those numbers are accurate in terms of the number po of positive tests. Um, and so testing is going to be absolutely critical over the next couple of weeks. Great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, our next speaker is Jay Glunt. Uh, Jay is a partner at Reed Smith, and we've asked him today to speak to the risk assessment considerations for businesses to weigh in anticipation of reopening. Um, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Kyle, appreciate that. Thank you so much to our friends at the conference for this invitation to speak. I really appreciate that. Thank you for the many people in attendance today. I'm gonna to spend my time talking about these five risk areas that we see as businesses across the Commonwealth reopen. In some cases, these risks apply to businesses that have stayed open as life-sustaining. Those adjectives, by the way, are frustrating to me because life-sustaining includes the ice cream shop and non-essential includes law firms. So I, I'm bothered on both sides of that. But nonetheless, some of these risks are already being faced by the companies currently operating. Can we go back to that last slide for just one more minute? Thank you. Um, what I want to talk with you about for a minute on point one, the compliance perspective. There's a, there's a couple of different ways to look at the compliance related risks. One is compliance for the sake of compliance, which many, if not all companies are concerned about. Compliance because there's a reason for the law that we are meant to comply with, that's important. Second reason is 
the penalties or the adverse consequences that might come into play if you don't comply. That might be a lawsuit or that might be some sort of government investigation or fine or penalty. But the third and the one that scares me the most, a lot of these new requirements and guidelines, and I'll talk about a few of them, are setting an expectation for employers of every, of every size that might be extremely challenging for some companies to meet. And by setting that expectation in the form of a legal requirement, there will be arguments made in the future that the standard of care has been established in terms of compliance with government orders and regulations. And the argument will be that if a worker is injured by getting sick from COVID-19 or dies from COVID-19, or if a family member of an employee dies from COVID-19, the arguments will be made in those wrongful death lawsuits that the employer did not meet the standard of care by not checking temperatures the right way, asking the right questions, providing the safe workplace. That aspect of where we're headed scares me quite a, quite a bit. The other risks here that in terms of how I categorize things are pretty self-explanatory. We're gonna be returning workers to the workplace and that means making selections and any time that we are making selections there are risks of discrimination claims. The enhanced unemployment compensation eligibility which I'll talk about in a minute creates some employee relations challenges. Many companies have or will be using cost saving measures that will include reduction of wages and salaries that creates risks related to wage and hour compliance. And then we have privacy related risks that are very important that come into play with all of the workplace safety requirements. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of those as we go through these uh, couple of slides I have. The next slide will talk about some of the industry and agency specific guidances. This is just by way of example, the EEOC, the CDC, Department of Labor, OSHA, and the FDA at the federal level all have guidances, regulations, requirements that employers need to be aware of. They, they are all pushing out policies and procedures that should be followed. The, ch the little chart here was published by the FDA for application in the food industry and the restaurant industry by way of example. And then we have you know, the state and local orders, which would include, for example, in Pennsylvania, the Department of Health's workplace safety order that requires all employees to wear masks. So these are just examples of some of the agency requirements that I'm talking about. Next slide, please. There, there's an angle to this that hasn't gotten a lot of attention yet, but I think it's coming and that is an antitrust issue. So this is just sort of issue spotting within your industry, whatever industry that is. I can almost guarantee that there is information sharing happening right now as Kyle said, we're in a very, very preliminary stage of reopening and employers in these different industries are talking with each other about best practices for, for returning people to work. Now, if the information being shared is what's the best way to install a plexiglass shield separating the customer from the, from the clerk, that's, that's not a problem. But if the information being shared is what are you doing about the federal unemployment supplement and trying to change someone's wages so that they're not quite as hard hit when they when they come back to work or how, did you cut pay and if so by how much any sort of level setting effort that gets to dollars that goes to pricing or wages could very well be an antitrust compliance problem in the justice department and the federal trade commission at the federal level and then state attorneys general at the state level have all been issuing press statements saying they're aware of this industry information sharing and they're watching that very closely for collusion or other anti-competitive conduct. We can go to the next slide. When you're returning people to the workforce, depending on their status, if you, if, you know, for example, perhaps they were laid off but still sort of on the books as an employee, or perhaps their employment actually ended then there are a long list of return to work considerations. This is just part of it. There's a lot of paperwork involved. There's a lot of documentation that will be involved. And there's an opportunity there to mitigate some of the risks by thinking through things like drug testing or things like wage and hour compliance or different policies. 
there's an opportunity now in that very preliminary preparation stage to sort of get those things in order. This would be a good, good thing to be focused on as a small business owner right now. And we can move on. This is what I was talking about in terms of the unemployment compensation employee relations challenge. So in a nutshell, because I believe that the people in attendance at this program are aware of the federal um, assistance here, there, are two, there were two different types of federal assistance that came about through the CARES Act. One's called pandemic unemployment assistance. That's the expansion of eligibility for unemployment compensation to people who never previously had eligibility. So that would be the small business owner himself or herself. That would be somebody who's self-employed, who's, whose income is reported on a 1099, for example, as an independent contractor. That would also be an employee who is currently seeking part-time work, where historically that might remove them from eligibility for unemployment. But now as a result of these changes, they are, they are eligible. This went live in Pennsylvania last week. There's a separate application form for that. And this is something that companies are looking at now that contractors that they were doing business with are now eligible for unemployment. That's an opportunity perhaps for the company to do some cost saving measures with respect to contractors as opposed to employees and still get those contractors into the unemployment compensation system. And that relates to the second aspect of enhancement, which is called pandemic unemployment emergency assistance. And that's the extra $600 per week of income that flows through the federal government that is automatic. And that is now happening in Pennsylvania, as far as I know. I believe, it's, I believe those checks have been um, issued for about the past two or maybe even three weeks now. Concept there is somebody applies for unemployment in the ordinary course under the Pennsylvania system. And if they are found to be eligible, then they automatically begin to receive this extra $600 per week. That's $15 an hour for 40 hours a week. That's how that would you know, break out. So if you're a part-time worker and you go on unemployment and you begin getting that $600 a week extra, you are making more money unemployed than you were employed. That extra $600 a week is taxable, but there's no withholdings on it. So it's a flat amount of $600. And in both cases, this federal increase eligibility adds 13 weeks to the total time of uh, eligibility for unemployment. So we have employee relations challenges to face now when the small business owner says to its workforce, good news, we're about to enter a yellow zone, we can bring you back. Those workers may not want to come back because they're making more money on unemployment than they, than they are when they return to work. And the next slide, please. And I mentioned this before about reducing wages and hours. This is a very common cost savings measure. Some companies have done this already. Some companies are looking to do this when they bring workers back. One thing here in particular that I wanna point out because I'm not sure that there's a lot of awareness about this risk. If you have an exempt employee, in other words, somebody who is not entitled to overtime and they're paid a salary, if you, if you reduce their salary to below $35,568 a year, you now need to make them hourly entitled to overtime. And even if, you, even if their salary is not below that amount, as it approaches that amount, their position would come under greater scrutiny if the Department of Labor ever had reason to look at it in terms of whether they're legally entitled to be in that exempt category. So please watch that. $35,568 a year salary level. And the next slide, please. Thank you, and this is my last slide. And I wanna talk about the privacy issues because I know this is really on employers' minds. The, the common question is we're bringing people back to work and we have, for example, in Pennsylvania, the Department of Health telling us if you have a, an actual confirmed COVID-19 exposure in the workplace or even a probable exposure, you need to start doing temperature screenings. Isn't that an invasion of privacy? And it certainly will feel like an invasion of privacy to the worker, and it certainly will be a trigger for lawsuits, but legally it's really not an invasion of their privacy. We are in a pandemic situation, and the EEOC has made it clear that employers can and probably should screen workers before they physically enter the workplace through things like temperature screenings or even questionnaires or certification forms, documents that would ask the employee about their symptoms, their exposure, 
whether they've been tested and so on. So the short answer to the privacy question is, I do think it's a big challenge and a big risk area. Employers are generally safe doing the screenings, especially those that are required by law, but it will be an employee relations problem. It is, some, it is the kind of risk that is likely to lead to some lawsuits down the road. Thank you. I believe that's all of the PowerPoint slides that I have for today. Okay, thank you very much, um, you know, for giving us that. There's obviously a lot that, you know, our businesses and employers need to account for, you know, beyond just looking towards that data when they can reopen. Um, you spoke a little bit at the beginning in terms of your concerns around employer liability. I guess, obviously, you know, as, as we've said from the outset, this is fluid, but um, it'd be interested to hear some insights or considerations, you know, as you think about that from sort of the customer relations side, you know, you spoke a lot to how to manage it from the employer employee side. And we do have some questions that seem to be coming through on that, but for the employer customer side of things, it'd be interested to get some insight from you there. Yeah, I think, thank you, Kyle, that's a great question. In my uh, opinion, that's probably more of a business related concern with some exceptions, for example, grocery stores and places like that will have some legal requirements. But I do think that a lot of the employment related things that are mandatory or best practice probably should be sort of pushed out to the customer. So for example, think about the customer of a hair salon, for example, before they are allowed to enter the hair salon, as we are in a yellow or green phase, perhaps having them sign something that talks about their, their health, um, that they're entering with consent, that they understand that there's risk. I think some things like that will become a lot more common and probably are a good practice. That's great. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate you making the time for us today. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, our final speaker is John O'Leary. Uh, John heads up the state and local government research for the Lavoie Center for Government Insights. Um, today, he's going to provide us with some insight into the considerations before governments as they also begin planning to reopen for certain functions. So thank you, John. Thank you, Kyle, so much. And uh, delighted to be here to talk about this topic and, and already absorbed a lot of great information from the other speakers. Um, I'll be coming at this conversation a little bit from the government perspective. Uh, Deloitte, I work for Deloitte Center for Government Insights. We look at government best practices. I am a former public official. I was the uh, chief human resources officer in Massachusetts, as well as the um, headed up the unemployment insurance. So I have a little bit of information about how government works in this space. And also since the crisis, the Center for Government Insights within Deloitte has been looking at how government is responding to this challenge, how they're thinking about things. So I may not be uh, speaking as directly to how businesses should be re thinking about responding, but I'll be trying to give you some perspective on how uh, government is thinking about things and what they're grappling with uh, so that it may, may provide some uh, insight as you guys move forward to try to figure out how that uh, you open up your own businesses and activities. So we can go to the next slide. So, uh, you know, we see this COVID-19 crisis as definitely going through a journey of uh, responding to the crisis, recovering, and then eventually thriving down the road. And we are now in the uh, late crisis response phase. Um, during the respond phase was overwhelmingly about the health crisis, about the need to get um, health capacity where it needed to be to handle the cases that were coming in. Uh, and that's now we're, we're definitely seeing the talk about recovery. And if you look at this green line that, that kind of shoots up as soon as the uh, crisis hits, that's an indicator of the level of speed and flexibility of government. And what we have seen in the past uh, six weeks or so, maybe two months now, is uh, just really dramatic uh, speed of government action. The ability to pass laws through Congress very rapidly, the uh, executive authority exercised uh, by governors and mayors to mandate things that in normal times, you know, that wouldn't even be considered, right? I mean, banning gatherings of more than 10 or 15 or 20 people or shutting down businesses throughout a state. Those are not the normal powers. They're not the normal part of the policy toolkit of, of public officials, but during a pandemic crisis, it made sense. You had a large degree of, of voluntary compliance. But now as we are coming out of that crisis phase, as we're going over the, the on the downslope of the health curve in most places, uh, we're seeing cases uh, going down, we're seeing deaths dropping, and thankfully in most places, we're also seeing a drop in that um, 
of speed and flexibility of government and the ability to, for those uh, kind, kind of rapid, unchallenged actions. And I would anticipate, and you're already starting to see it, you're starting to see more, more um, uh, political protests, more uh, pushback from municipal uh, leaders to their state governors, right? Mayors versus governors in some cases, or governors uh, pushing back against the federal government. And that is sort of a, a, a more return to the normal checks and balances approach that, that government normally, normally works under. Uh, as, as we proceed through the recovery phase, um, we expect to see that sort of flexibility continue to drop. Uh, and then hopefully there'll be new systems put in place in government that'll, that'll enable quicker action. A lot of the stuff that uh, we've been hearing about earlier from earlier speakers have to do with um, guidelines. And government has, has been able to put out guidelines very rapidly during this crisis, but they oftentimes haven't gone through all of the, the standard uh, public comment periods, and they certainly haven't been embedded into uh, legislation in most cases. So it's a really uh, sort of curious in-between space where government is acting very rapidly through, through guidance and directives and executive orders and, and those sorts of things, um, as opposed to some of the pieces of uh, legislation. Now we do have legislation in the CARES Act, and we're already seeing you know, questions arising as to how that's gonna be executed and how the various agencies are gonna execute that. Uh, next size. So uh, the, the crisis has really been, been seen on three fronts, right? There's been a health crisis that has been the, the primary focus of the media. There's also the economic crisis, which has largely been a artifact of the uh, efforts to stop the spread of disease, right? You know, you want to flatten the curve, but at the same time, that's flattening the economy in many ways. Um, but there's a third sort of front that is out there that uh, is less talked about, but is keenly uh, apparent for those who work in government. And that is how do we keep the, the business of government operating, operating as we respond, recover and thrive. And if you think about it, um, uh, you know, as we move through these phases, we're definitely gonna be you know, doing testing and monitoring, but the business of government is gonna be coming back online at the same time that uh, uh, businesses are, right? And in some cases, government never shut down, some government agencies have totally shut down. In some cases, they've seen a, a massive surge in demand um, and, and trying to uh, kind of figure out how government is going to, to operate in the coming months is a huge challenge for public officials that largely falls under the radar. Uh, so um, one of the things about the recover phase is there's large agreement whether the plan is the White House plan or most governors plans or plans put out by the National Governor Association or other think tanks is that the, uh, uh, the, the um, there's two factors during the recover phase. One is that you should be closely monitoring your health circumstances to make sure that the disease isn't having flare-ups or second waves, right? And then the second is that there should be phased reopenings. And on those phased reopenings, there's general broad agreement on the notion that the businesses that should be opening first are those that have the most economic import, economic impact, and are the safest to reopen. That's common sense. But as soon as you start to translate those sort of common sense guidelines into actual choices and distinctions between does the florist get to open and the hair salon doesn't? Uh, if the hair salon can open, why can't the tattoo parlor? If a uh, you know, coffee shop can't open, why can a food store open? What's the difference between a coffee, you know, a bar that sells food and a restaurant that sells alcohol? Um, all these sorts of uh, distinctions that have never been made before uh, become tricky. The other thing that, that I'll point out is, and a lot of these discussions have, have pointed towards, is the health monitoring aspect um, of, of the crisis is in many ways, uh, you know, it's sort of like attempting to implement a, a massive OSHA-like uh, go, uh, government oversight body on the fly. And that's not something that is, uh, you know, that's not how ge government generally works. It's not easy. These discretion factors are, are really hard for um, a government to deal with that uncertainty and that discretion. Uh, it, it's easier for public officials to work <clears throat> in an environment where there are clear rules, clear guidelines. And in the absence of those, you, you have more questions than answers, which is why I see so many questions coming through on the, uh, uh, the call today. And I'll, I'll try, to, try to wrap up soon so we can have a chance to get at them. But I wanted to say a little bit about testing. Um, one of the things that 
about this pandemic that occurred was that early on, there was just absolutely inadequate capability to test for this disease in, a, in the United States. Other Asian countries who had seen prior uh, pandemics like SARS uh, in the 2000s and MERS um, were, were in a much uh, better place to react quickly and get testing out there. As recently as March 30th, uh, we were able to test only less than 100,000 COVID tests per day in the United States. Uh, that's since gone up to about 150,000, a little more than 150,000 right now per day. But a lot of the um, a lot of the plans that are out there being discussed talk about the need for 750,000 or a million more tests per day for the COVID test. Do you have COVID or not? And there's questions around um, sort of the expense and intrusiveness of those tests. There's also uh, a new work being done on not just tests for the COVID, the disease itself, but also for the antibodies to try to figure out who has had it in the past. And there's some interesting findings right now uh, in New York and in California where we're beginning to understand that the disease may be much more widespread. Many more people may have had this and not been aware of it than we had previously thought, um, th which affects the lethality numbers that we're seeing about the disease as well, right? Uh, and I'm not a doctor, I'm a policy analyst, but um, th these uh, ability to, to understand where the disease is, where it is regionally, will really, really rely on what government can do on these testings. And it may be the case that they will be looking to partner with um, employers in the same way that government partners with employers on things like um, uh, citizenship eligibility for work and, and putting some of the burden on employers to, to make sure that their folks who work for them are eligible uh, to work as citizens. In a similar way, there may be uh, leveraging of employers in this role coming down the line, but it's not clear. What is clear is that a number of states are working to bolster their ability to test, track, and trace. And this tracking and tracing thing is a tricky area. Uh, the way it has been done in some Asian nations, for example, uh, is very intrusive. And um, the ability of the government to, to track your every movement, uh, everywhere you go, uh, your ability to limit your ability to move around based on uh, whether or not you have the disease is something that you know, we're probably not culturally and politically um, willing to accept in this country. But at the same time, it's proven effective in some areas the ability to identify outbreaks and to quickly trying to quarantine and limit the spread, particularly as the disease is in its early phases and there's only a few cases. Uh, efforts to do this uh, are growing. Uh, <clears throat> Minnesota has a team of 100 uh, contact tracers in place. Uh, Massachusetts, New York, California are all taking steps towards bringing folks on board who can help try to trace the, the, the spread of the disease, whether this will be done manually or electronically or what have you, uh, still up in the air to a certain extent. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just, this is talking some about that, that testing. I'll skip this slide for now. Go ahead and give me more. Uh, so I, I wanna talk about um, the, 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 the challenges that all businesses are facing in terms of reopening, how to deal with employees, all this sort of thing. The same sets of challenges are being faced uh, by governments. And the one thing I will say is that uh, whereas uh, a large, you know, chain of coffee shops, for example, uh, has to figure out, you know, it's a hard challenge to try to figure out how you're going to reopen, how you're going to take local guidance and, and follow all the local ordinances. They do have the advantage of, of scale and they also have the advantage of um, being involved in a, a very similar activity in lots of different places right? It becomes much more difficult when you are an organization like government, where you have uh, an amazing variety of activities, right? You have office workers that, that do office work. So you have to figure out, you know, how do we do social distancing? Do we require masks? How do we keep people safe when they go to the cafeteria or on break? Uh, what do we do about the fact that, uh, you know, we have a 25-story office building and uh, four elevators that are constantly full all day, 
Uh, how do you maintain social distancing? Uh, or how do you get people up to the 25th floor? What do you do about telework? Who's eligible for telework? Who's not? And in the public setting, that also often runs against, um, uh, you know, organized uh, concerns by the by the workforce, and 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 again, those those selection criteria can 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 be tricky. Um, in addition to, to office work though, government has things like mass transit workers, where you're interacting with the customers at the Department of Motor Vehicles or in uh, a, a train or a bus. And you also have places where, you know, prison guards, uh, you run prisons. So you have to uh, be concerned for the health of the, the, the wards as well as the employ your employees. You also have uh, things like social workers where you have a need to go into homes. You have law enforcement and public safety where you need to go into homes you know, in an emergency basis and you need to tackle people. And uh, the, 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 all the challenges uh, around measuring and monitoring the health of your employees, measuring and monitoring the, the health of your customers, uh, working to rearrange work environments so as they are, they become COVID safe. Uh, every every challenge that that businesses face, governments face, and they face it um, in a whole bunch of different areas. So it, it, it is a lot of challenge for them to do that. The other huge challenge is that is that regular challenge, uh, regulatory challenge, where um, uh, government is. Uh, it's very very difficult to try to create guidelines that make sense apply them even handedly and to do so sort of when your own workforce and your own environment is in chaos. If you can go to the next slide, if you, if you look at um, sort of where government is right now, right? Uh, they are, you know, like everybody else work, you know, use, use people to use tools to serve the public and fulfill the mission, right? But in a new post, post COVID reality, there are new challenges associated with the public workforce. There are new tools out there and new responsibilities, new expectations of citizens, and a whole bunch of new missions, uh, regulatory missions, testing missions that government has to take on. If you look at state government, they're in a place where their revenues are down dramatically as well, just like a lot of businesses are. Uh, they are um, having seen huge spikes in demand for services in areas like unemployment. Having been a former unemployment uh, director, I can tell you that getting a federal piece of legislation and then implementing it on the fly with millions of unemployed coming in the door, you're very likely to see lots of um, uh, lots of improper payments. You're likely to see lots of uh, folks waiting to get approved. It's just an extraordinarily difficult difficult task. So you have uh, states with with revenues are down, the demands are up, the operating environment itself is challenged, the physical uh, environment is challenged, and uh, a whole bunch of new responsibilities. One of the main one being guiding this phased reopening and making the decisions over what's essential, what's safe. And I, I really think that this is going to be an extremely fluid, very um, uh, feedback oriented uh, loop. This isn't something that you design, it's something you sort of feel your way through and it, it is likely to have uh, challenges and difficulties along the way. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, give up my last couple of slides uh, to give an opportunity to get to some of these important questions that everyone is having and say thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. And thanks everyone for your questions. Uh, we have quite a few, so we will get through as many as we can. Uh, John, let's just jump in on one. You touched a lot on the interpretation of kind of who's deemed essential and economically most impactful to, to drive what businesses can open first. Do you anticipate that clarification coming out in advance of us moving into a yellow phase so people can have the opportunity to prepare, get staff back on, things like that? Yeah, I think you'll have to, and, and you know, it, it'll probably break down, there'll probably be, be um, an effort to break down by sectors and types of businesses, um, as has already been done in construction, you know, some of the guidelines in Pennsylvania, there'll be general guidelines that'll go out. And I think that whatever those guidelines are, there's going to have to be a need also for some kind of a hotline where people can call up and say, you know, I'm, uh, I, I think I saw one of the questions was, you know, uh, to what extent is a summer camp under the same guidelines as a daycare? Or uh, uh, I have a restaurant that also has a gift shop attached to it. Um, you know, what goes on there? Um, 
just, uh, uh, you know, as well as, you know, one of the things we didn't touch on is that this disease is, is very mercurial and very uh, hard, to, hard to pin down. You may have situations where your workforce may need to be treated differently or your customers may need to be tr treated differently on the basis of their risk to the disease. One factor, huge factor is age, but there are other qualifying factors, asthma and, and hypertension that, you know, to what extent do you need to inform and guide, you know, for different activities? I, I am, uh, I think that one of the things I'll just try to communicate is the extraordinary challenge that public sector has in trying to establish guidelines on the fly like this with a workforce that is themselves dispersed and trying to sort it out for their own businesses to bring them back safely uh, to then also generate these regulations is just going to be a real, real challenge. And everyone's hungry for that certainty and that guidance. And I'm not certain that we're going to get it in a manner that is going to be satisfactory anytime soon. Thanks. Is there any consideration of the government limiting the liability for businesses that do reopen, you know, a patronize at your own risk type of thing? That's yeah, we've, we've talked about this a little bit. It's sort of, uh, uh, you know, in New Hampshire, if you or if you go skiing anywhere, um, you know, you, you, when you buy a lift ticket, you basically, if you actually read the thing, it's like basically if anything that happens, you're such an idiot to go skiing in the first place that you, you assume all the risks of what, what happens after the fact. But I'll leave to the lawyer as to what at, you know what level you can do there because it's just not at all clear that um, you can you can issue a blanket one. But there's also diseases are a, a, a strange animal because you never know where they came from. Yeah, Jay, let's switch to some of the legal questions that we're getting in. Um, one specifically around if an employee doesn't want to return to work. To your point, they're making more money on unemployment. Kind of what are the employer's rights? Are do they have the right to terminate that employee if they choose not to come back? Um, yes. I describe that as an employee relations challenge, and that's really what, what I think it mostly is. A couple of ways that scenario could play out. One way is the employer could just put the person on the payroll, just say, now you're on the payroll, you're going to be getting money from the company. And when that person next submits their application for unemployment, they'll have to report the money that they're getting from their employer, and that will probably remove them from eligibility. Clients of mine that are doing that are those clients receiving the PPP loan money, and they're putting people on the payroll in order to get the forgiveness of the PPP loan. But another way to approach it would be, again, on the employee relations side, to just have a conversation with that employee, try to overcome their objection about coming back and talk with them about, you know, right now, short term, you're making more money. That's going to run out the end of July. We're looking at this as a much longer term um, relationship, hopefully. We want you to come back and be a, a productive part of this business. Uh, so, you know, it's more of an employee relations issue than anything. I'm not sure that terminating the employee is the best way to go. I think you would characterize it as we have available work for you and you're turning down the opportunity to do that available work. And at that point, then they won't be eligible for unemployment anymore. So you touched you on it. Oh, go ahead, I was, I was just, just to add on to, to that, Al, so one of the really tricky things um, on that particular issue is that's really a state by state um, enforcement. And so each state handles that and has the capacity to handle that refusal to return to work a little bit differently. And so that adds another layer, I think, of complication that some states are probably going to move um, on that particular issue faster than maybe other states. And Jay, uh, speaking of the PPP, or, or maybe Matt, um, when do you anticipate the phase 3.5 CARES Act funding to actually be available and for people to be able to apply for the IDLE and the PPP loans? That's a Matt question. I, I haven't seen it as of today, but I would expect um, if it's not up and running today, then in the next couple of days. But again, that, um, the PPP part of that is going to move very quickly. Um, as did the, the first tranche of funding. And then Jay, just a couple specific um, questions as well. You know, where would- real, Allison, real quickly on the PPP, the story just broke while we were in real time, while we were on the webinar, that they're looking to, to restart PPP on Monday. Okay. Um, where would you recommend people to find legal resources? There's been some questions about uh, businesses that don't have a formal HR department and where they should go for resources. Should they seek legal counsel to kind of move through forms and best practices? 
Absolutely, yes. There's, there are a lot of adjectives that have been used to describe this time. We've used a number of them already today in this webinar. Unprecedented, uncertain. The adjective that I like to use is hug your lawyer. This is a hug your lawyer environment. Uh, most people don't like lawyers, except they love their lawyer who helps them navigate. Uh, employers have to find a way to get legal counsel today. There are just so many changes in the law and so many opportunities for misstep. The really small employers, there are some legal clinics out there that might be useful, or there might be a way to, through an association of small businesses, get advice that can trickle down. But, but um, all employers today need to find a way to get some legal advice to help them through this. And then Jay, one more question for you. And then Matt, I have some for the governor's um, interpretation that, that came to you early on. Um, if you have an exempt employee who you'd like to bring back part-time and therefore be non-exempt, can you do that while you're kind of in the in-between phase? Yes, that, that is a safe thing to do, yes. Okay. And then Matt, a lot of questions around kind of child care and how is the governor planning on supporting working families when schools remain closed throughout the summer? You know, how do summer camps fit into that? Um, if you can touch a little bit on that. Yeah, I would just echo, I think, what both John and Jay have noted. This is going to be, this is an ongoing fluid um, situation. I mean, this is going to require constant monitoring, almost, um, you know, control tower capability where you're adjusting on the fly, by the week, um, to events as, as warranted. I would put the, the summer camps into that category. On the childcare front, I think the, the positive news is the, the, the Wolf administration views that as in, intrinsically tied to reopening the economy. Um, and that will be something that I think is, receives very robust focus um, from the state to, to be determined, but I expect uh, that to be an area where there's state assistance. And as I said, I think there's a need um, certainly for, for really large scale federal assistance in that area as well. And another question that just came in, and then I'll have some closing thoughts, but if an employee is not able to return to work because of a lack of childcare, what are those options? I'll take a quick stab at that. If that employer has less than 500 employees, then that individual would be covered by the Families First Act, which is part of the federal stimulus package, and that employee would have the right to paid leave through federal law. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think for the last question, maybe just a, a general one is, you know, what do you see as the best resources for people to follow moving forward? It's such a fluid situation. There's so many different places to find information. Um, are there any recommendations you have for people to kind of sort through this as, as it's changing so quickly? Not a I, that, question. It, that's a great, it, like, no, that's a great from, question. Yeah, I mean, it, there, there are, there are the, the problem is there's too many and it's, it's um, none of them have the specific questions that you want answered. They're not easy to find. I mean, there, there's, um, uh, you know, Lloyd Center for Government, so we put out reports uh, and we're going to be, we put out one last week on the overall response. We're going to be putting one out on economic reopening next week. National Governors Association puts stuff out, but there's a million things putting out general guidance. The problem is with governments, you're going to get information, as Jay pointed out, from a whole bunch of different sources, different levels of government, federal, state, and local. Um, it is just going to be, the reality is that it's going to be hard to find the right answers. Um, even to, you know, before the COVID crisis, you, you know, try to figure out who's an employee and who isn't. Right, Jay, you got to go to three different sources, get three different answers. IRS has a definition, labor has another definition. So, you know, there's, there's all different things. It's not easy. It's the challenge of our modern world. Totally agree. One, one, one that I'll mention that I think is doing a great job, and this is not a one-stop kind of a place, but the Pennsylvania Unemployment Compensation Office, I think, has really done a tremendous job of putting great information on its website in a very user-friendly form. A lot of the other agencies at the state, and local, and federal level, you ha really have to search to find what you're looking for. I really feel like the Unemployment Compensation Office has done a nice job with that. Yeah, I would just echo that. I think both um, resources on the public sector side and the private sector side are going to be absolutely vital. Um, you know, employers are going to have a role in disseminating this information. 
um, as John alluded to, public sector, um, local, state, and federal government is going to have to be very nimble and adaptable, um, you know, in this new normal moving forward and providing information, you know, on the fly and that, that by necessity is very fluid and might change um, from week to week or month to month. And, and so I think both the public and the private sector certainly have a role in disseminating this information. That's great. Thank you um, to all our presenters today who contributed to this conversation. Um, Matt Smith with the Greek Chamber of Commerce, Jay Glunt with Reed Smith, John O'Leary with Detroit, or Deloitte, pardon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we also want to make sure to thank everybody who participated in today's webinar. Uh, we hope you find these conversations helpful and informative. Uh, once again, we do want to thank our sponsors, Peoples, Giant Eagle, Highmark, and UPMC Health Plan for their generous support which allows us to produce this critical programming. Again, we do wanna remind you that the Allegheny Conference has launched a website that we hope serves as a resource for all of you and is a repository of important resources, legislative updates, and ways you can help and ways you can get help. Um, you can find a link at the top of our homepage at alleghenyconference.org or see it there on the slide. Um, additionally, um, to the conversation that just happened and to help us and our partners better understand what support, information, and programming will be most useful to businesses and organizations as you begin planning to reopen. We've released a survey that you can find at the bit.ly address on, this, on the screen at the bottom of the slide. Be on the lookout for an invitation to join our next webinar in the Allegheny Conference's Response and Recovery webinar series. We'll be meeting you where you are with a lot of great programming, so please continue to watch your inbox. Thank you all, and stay safe, everyone.